Have you ever looked at a taser and thought, is this an engine? If you have, I'd look into getting contacts, but you would be onto something. In 1906, Dr. Robert Goddard, the father of modern rocketry, suggested accelerating particles by electrically charging them, as opposed to just using combustion. This was more seriously considered in 1955, in a paper titled Possibilities of Electrical Spaceship Propulsion, presented by, uh, this guy, which kicked off interest in the topic. Now more than theory, ion engines have a rich history, and engines work on the simple principle of charged particle attraction. In a vacuum, this is difficult, considering that, by definition, there are almost no particles. For me, however, by, well, not working in a vacuum, I can ionize the ambient air, and it gets much easier. This would more so fall under ionic wind, and consider the field of electrohydrodynamics in its entirety brings the date back even further to, uh, 1709. One of the most recent advances in this field was the first heavier-than-air aircraft powered by ionic wind, which is what first inspired me to look into creating an electrohydrodynamic thruster myself. But, for the sake of pronunciation and charm, I'll just stick with ion engine. This is about as simple of an ion engine as it gets. The copper wire on the right is an anode, using high voltage to ionize ambient nitrogen, which is then attracted to the cathodes, which is the copper plumbing tubing. As the charged nitrogen moves, it collides with other atoms, creating ionic wind, as many different molecules are pushed in one direction. Oh, what was that? Air is an insulator, so how can we possibly ionize nitrogen? Great question. Well, the term insulator is kind of misleading. Things are only insulators at a certain reference point. Electrical breakdown is the process in which insulators become conductors at sufficiently high voltages. This happens once the voltage is higher than the specific breakdown voltage of the insulator, with ambient air being around 3.3 kilovolts per millimeter. This is a high voltage converter, which is 399, for essentially a cheap or technically a stun gun. This can step up voltages an incredible amount, outputting 1,000 kilovolts. Stun guns work on a slightly different principle than ion engines, where instead of ionizing the air and then attracting those charged particles to a cathode, they instead crank that soldier boy. They crank up the voltage even higher and allow the electricity to arc through the air. This is how a Jacob's ladder works, or just plain old lightning. Since breakdown voltage is relative to the distance of the gap. A stun gun can turn into a basic ion engine by widening the gap between the connectors and vice versa. If I mess up the ion engine and put the anode and plate a little bit too close together, it will arc and eliminate nearly all of the ionic wind and leave me with a pretty and engine, but at least the crackling sounds cool. However, I first have to check how powerful these converters really are, which is putting the wires close to each other and seeing at what distance they will no longer arc. By connecting the converter to power, measuring the gap, and assuming a standard breakdown voltage, we assume the output of the converter is around 33 kilovolts, roughly. However, to be fair, a 9-volt battery is suboptimal and is nowhere near even the minimum recommended amperage for the converter. Turning this converter into an engine, though, would take a little bit of work. The anode needs to be sharp and the cathode larger and smoother, so ionization can happen at a point and then attract to the cathode in a controlled direction. Early on, I only wanted to use copper tubing as my cathode, as copper is extremely conductive and would prevent thrust being lost from poor material selection. I wanted to use a reducing pipe at first, as that would choke the air at the nozzle and make the moving air faster, but Home Depot only had one. If needed, I knew I could customize some kind of throat for the engine to reduce volume and increase airspeed with my 3D printer. Speaking of which, almost immediately after coming home, I got to measuring and created a ring to fit around the copper tubes to keep them in the same direction. By extending this ring a bit to further stabilize the tubes in the middle and having the outline of that subtract from the rectangle, I used that to create a non-conductive stand to hold the cathodes to prevent static building up on the tail and reducing the engine's performance. My initial test is just to use the bare wire of the converter, but even that was sufficient to get noticeable thrust. For the next iteration, I used copper wire as the anodes, 3D printing a matching stand to hold the anodes perfectly center of each cathode. I bent the wires and taped them in place before meticulously trying to straighten them. Having the wires mounted on the same exact stand as the cathode made it easy to position the wires, and the copper wire was a lot more conductive than the bare wire of the converter, and so it ionized the air more efficiently. In low light, you can even see plasma forming. It's really difficult to show plasma on camera, but it really is quite beautiful in person. Unfortunately, plasma being visible meant that the anodes were too close together, so I moved them further from each other to get a little more kick. Though the copper wiring made a huge improvement in the thrust of the engine, it also had a few of its own problems. 
Slight differences in length of wire would make uneven thrust between the tubes, and the wire easily bent, and that could have huge impacts on the thrust on the engine as well, depending on how much it was bent. And so began the wild goose chase. To improve upon the malleability problem, I tried different methods of making rigid and conductive anodes. First, as a thorough mechanical pencil enjoyer, I tested graphite pencil lead using various ones from my collection. From 0.9mm basic lead to 0.3mm nano diamond blend leads, nothing matched the conductive performance of the copper wire. That had a noticeable impact on the thrust. The improvements in rigidity were overshadowed by the brittleness as well. Instead of a slight bend in the wire, now the anode would snap and it'd have to replace the graphite entirely. Even when not broken, the copper wire was still the clear winner. Next, I tried using some nails that I had lying around. I hope I have my tetanus shots because some of these are beyond rusted. I plan on removing the layer of oxide on the surface and then electroplating copper onto the metal underneath. Electroplating is the process in which an electric current is able to deposit a thin layer of metal onto the surface of an object. This process involves immersing an object in a metal salt solution containing metal ions and apply a current to attract and bond the ions to the object's surface. The nails would be rigid and sharp and I was hoping that the layer of copper added to them would make them so conductive that they would be the optimal anode. I went to my chemistry teacher, who helped me first remove the rust by soaking the nails in acid, which only worked for the nails made out of iron, and those were already corroded to the point of no return, and so they were scrapped. The other ones were made out of other unknown materials, but were likely zinc-plated, and simply couldn't be cleaned. I had to work under a fume hood, since I used copper 2 chloride as the metal salt solution, and that would release chlorine gas. Yeah, I probably should have stuck with copper sulfate. It can't be that bad though, right? In any case, the copper just would not bond to the nail. For some reason, there was a layer of copper on the nails that formed, but it was rough and effortlessly wiped off with a paper towel. I dropped the voltage down from 9 volts to a AA battery, 1.5 volts, but the copper just would not bond still. I suspect it was because I used zinc as the sacrificial anode instead of copper, which left a strange alloy of zinc and copper, but I quite frankly can't be sure. Finally, I gave in and got copper-coated weather nails from Home Depot. I felt like I was taking the easy way out, but they ended up being less conductive than the copper wire, and their small size made them not so great anodes. And such, despite the drawbacks, the copper wire was, from the beginning, the best option for the anode. I think I could step up the electroplating game and use a 3D printed anode shape and then a conductive layer painted on top and then electroplating that conductive layer, but it would just be needlessly difficult. With the copper wire, the engine was making all right thrust, but I had one more trick up my sleeve. I was powering this with a single 9 volt battery, which, although within the voltage range, had a puny amperage. So I brought the fully assembled engine to school with me and borrowed a power supply from the physics classroom. Here, I was free to crank up the amperage and see the engine working at maximum power. The higher power made it more prone to arcing violently, and so every now and again it would crack really loudly, and I'd have to turn it off and wait to resume so I wouldn't get it shut down. The amperage that worked best seemed to be around 3 amps, which is around the ballpark of being more than enough to stop your heart territory, but I was careful enough with it that it was never in real danger. Unless I wasn't and I just didn't notice. With this power supply giving a lot more amperage than a 9 volt battery, the engine produced enough thrust to noticeably push paper and not question if it was a stray gust of wind. That meant I could hold it in my hand and not use a dedicated test rig for the paper. Overall, I'm fairly happy with the result of this project. I've been wanting to build a functional ion engine for years, ever since that electroaerodynamic airframe paper first came out. <sighs> Easy for me to say. Experimenting with improvements to the anodes, even if they failed, was still fun. It was the first time I worked under a fume hood, and the first time I worked with a power supply cranked up so high. The design process of trying something new and then utterly failing was a big part of this. Every turn of the different anode designs looked promising until suddenly they didn't. I do have a few more projects that I'm wrapping up soon, so it won't be too long until the next video. But other than that, have a good night, y'all.